Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar. I'm Melissa Romero, Forensic Science Consultant in CNA and Media Group. I will be moderating today's event. This webinar is titled Hit Finding Success with Dells in Academia, Dell Open Case Studies. This event is sponsored by Wuxi App Tech. CNN works with sponsors to identify topics of interest and value to CNN's audience and consistent with CNN's mission to provide news and analysis of the chemistry enterprise in a timely, accurate, and balanced fashion. During the webinar, you can adjust the size of the slides on your screen by grabbing the lower right corner with your mouse. If you need technical assistance, please look at the help widget at the bottom of your screen or type your query into the Q&A box. If you are disconnected during the webcast, please log in again according to the instructions you received earlier. You are encouraged to contribute to the success of this webinar by asking questions at any time during the presentation through the Q&A box on your screen. The questions will be answered at the end of the presentation, and as your moderator, I will be posing as many as time permits. This webcast allows certification of participation. To receive your certificate, please click on the certificate icon below your Q&A box to download your copy after, after watching the webinar. Please note that CNEN does not endorse any company, products, or services that may be mentioned in the webinars. Each webinar will be archived at CNEN online after the live webcast. This presentation today is sponsored by Wuxi AppTech, a company that provides a broad portfolio of services that enable organizations in the pharmaceutical, biotech, and medical device industries worldwide to advance discoveries and deliver groundbreaking treatments to patients. As an innovation-driven and customer-focused company, Wuxi AppTech helps their partners improve the productivity of advancing healthcare products through cost-effective and efficient, socially responsible, and sustainable solutions. With industry-leading capabilities such as R&D and manufacturing for small molecule drugs, cells, and gene therapies, and testing for medical devices, Wuxi AppTech's open access platform is enabling more than 4,100 collaborators from over 30 countries to improve the health of those in need and to realize their vision that every drug can be made and every disease can be treated. During the presentation, we will be hearing from Dr. Richard Soule, Dr. Roger Kornberg, Dr. Casey Kruzmark, and Dr. Matthew Disney. Dr. Roger Kornberg is the Mrs. George A. Windsor Professor in Medicine and Professor of Structural Biology in Stanford Medicine. He was awarded the Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 2006 for his studies of the molecular bases of eukaryotic transcription. Dr. Richard Soule is presently Senior Advisor, Strategic Initiatives for the Research Service Division at Wuxi AppTech and the head of the Wuxi office in Boston, Massachusetts. He has held various leadership roles at Wuxi as Senior Vice President, including Head of the Medicinal Chemistry Unit, known as the International Discovery Service Unit, the Business Development and Corporate Allies. Dr. Casey Kruzmark is Associate Professor of Medicinal Chemistry and Molecular Pharmacology at Purdue University. His group works on applications of DNA-encoded libraries for both novel ligand discovery and proteomatic activity-based probes with a focus on protein kinesis and chromodomains. Dr. Matt Disney is a native of Baltimore and is currently professor in the Department of Chemistry at Scripps Research on the Florida campus. His laboratory works in the area of small molecule targeting, targeting of RNA. The lab seeks to answer fundamental questions regarding molecular recognition events between RNA folds and small molecules to study problems of biomedical importance. We will start with a short introduction to the Dell Open Platform by Dr. Jason Dung, head of the Wuxi AppTech's Dell Lab in Boston. This will then be followed by an incisive discussion between Dr. Soule and Dr. Kornberg, and then presentations by Dr. Kruzmark and Dr. Disney. And now let's begin with Dr. Jason Dung. Thank you, Melissa, for the introduction. And of course, thanks to all of you who joined this CNN webinar for Hit Finding Success with DNA Encoded Library in Academia. I'm going to spend the next five minutes to share with you a brief introduction to the Dell Open Platform and how this platform has been widely used by academia community to access the DNA encoded library technology for small molecule drug discovery. DNA encoded libraries, short for Dell, was firstly invented in academia groups in 1990s and was later adopted by pharmaceutical industry in mid 2000 
The technology has been successfully transitioned from conception to industrialization over the last 15 years, thanks to many scientists and pioneers working in the field, while Dell has been bringing increasing success to drug discovery programs the access to this powerful platform was relatively limited to companies and organizations who had put down significant investment beforehand. This is the reason that motivated the development of the Dell Open Platform, with a goal to bring the use of the Dell technology back to the larger academia and the non-profit communities and to benefit the drug discovery research at a greater scale. What Dell Open aims to achieve is to establish a channel to bridge the providers who produce Dell libraries and its infrastructure and the users who have limited or no prior knowledge of Dell but have a protein target of interest for small molecule discovery. University PIs and researchers can register their interest on the Dell Open website to receive the Dell libraries from the providers. The affinity selection can be entirely carried out in their own facilities before returning the samples to the providers for data decoding. After the completion of the experiment part, the providers and the users can later enter the contract phase, where the users have the choices to either review the legal structures for their own discovery campaigns in a royalty-free fashion or to share the selection data possibly along with the chemistry and the method information to the broader Dell Open community for the data sharing of 4.4 billion and the increasing structures in the Dell Open libraries. Wuxi AppTech Dell Open workflow is depicted here and it starts with a shipment of Dell Open libraries in a kit box. The researchers performed affinity selection according to the provided instructions against their protein of interest, and then shipped the samples back to Wuxi, where the samples will be QC'd, sequenced, and analyzed. Upon signing a contract, Wuxi will later synthesize up to five top compounds for the users to perform biological validation. From there, the users have the choice to agree to either keep the compounds for their own discovery programs or to share the data. What makes Wuxi's Dell Open Library special? The building blocks and scaffolds that go into the Dell Open Library are selected based on hot pharmacophores with favorable physical properties. It consists of a pool of 30 libraries and 4.4 billion structures, and the number is increasing as the libraries are periodically updated. Pre-production validation is performed to ensure successful chemistry routes and conditions. The production is carried out through a semi-automated process to ensure consistency and the reproducibility. There are also multiple stepwise controls to monitor product yields by LC mass spec and electrophoresis, followed by next-gen sequencing analysis on DNA tag integrity and translation rate. I hope this brief introduction gives you a good impression that Dell Open Platform is built for promoting open access of the Dell technology to the broader community around the globe. To date, we already have hundreds of user cases, and among them, we are going to proudly share with you some of the success stories in the following sections of this webinar. Now, please let me introduce you to the interview between Dr. Roger Kornberg and Dr. Richard So discussing the future state of Dell and how it will bring more success to drug discovery. I'm Rich Saul of Wuxi Aptech, and we welcome you in joining us today on the webinar, Fit Finding Success with DNA Encoder Libraries in Academia. In this session, I have the distinct privilege to discuss the state and future of DNA Encoder Libraries with our distinguished guest, Professor Roger Kornberg, the Windsor Professor of Medicine in the Department of Structural Biology at Stanford University. He's the 2006 Nobel Laureate in Chemistry in recognition of his seminal studies on the molecular basis of eukaryotic transcription, the process by which DNA is copied to RNA. And he's a member of the US Academy 
uh, National Academy of Sciences. Thank you, Roger, for being here today. Thank you, Rich. It's always a pleasure. I look forward to a conversation. Great. Uh, in a CME news article published in 2017 in reference to DNA encoded library technology, you said once a leap forward in technology takes place, then people begin to think of all kinds of ingenious ways of, of putting it to use. We're just at the beginning. So let me ask you, what's transpired uh, in the last uh, four years and how has the platform uh, advanced biomedical research? So uh, in the first place, uh, let me illustrate the point and explain why I made that remark. Uh, and a perfect illustration is the example of the recombinant DNA revolution. Uh, when recombinant DNA was invented, then what followed was a true deluge of participation from around the world. And all of those who joined brought ingenious ideas for exploiting the technology, for improving the technology and what have you. Now you asked what has transpired since the uh, invention of DNA encoded libraries. Of course, we must bear in mind that the idea is actually decades old, but the realization of it more recent, only in the last few years with high throughput sequencing and what have you. So really the answer to your question dates to the realization. And uh, what has transpired uh, is similarly remarkable. And uh, it falls in several categories. First, the improvement of the technology. So once the basic idea was established, then clever chemistries uh, were introduced and continue to be improved to uh, increase the range and the precision and ultimately the product, the DNA encoded libraries. Uh, the, uh, the, what has transpired really is the, uh, the maturation of this important uh, innovation. Thank you. So where do you see the technology going and what kind of uh, key considerations and directions do we need to address in order to leverage uh, the full potential of Dell technology? So I see it going first to the original purpose, which was drug development. But beyond that, to the elucidation of human biology, uh, the opportunity uh, to derive molecules that will either interfere with or even enhance uh, every biochemical reaction in the body uh, represents, if you were, as it were, a, a, an alternative to the genetics that we cannot do on human beings. Uh, so it has great therapeutic value, but beyond that, it has important significance for fundamental science. Do you see potential benefits in combining uh, the Dell platforms with emerging technologies uh, such as microfluidics or uh, AI and machine learning uh, methods? So there are a number of emerging technologies which can be combined with Dell to achieve uh, as it were, uh, uh, apparently unrelated benefit. Uh, now, you allude to AI, and um, you're doubtless aware, I don't know if our listeners know, of a significant recent publication showing how uh, AI applied not just to the best molecule derived by Dell, but the whole suite of molecules of varying potency uh, to then uh, discover uh, even better molecules from the combination of all of that information. The, uh, the, the microfluidic technology, of course, uh, facilitates applications in diverse areas uh, for uh, diagnostics, for example, and for uh, other kinds of uh, detection technology. Beyond those two examples that you mentioned, uh, I might add uh, in, uh, one that interests me particularly, and that is an application to uh, computational biology. Uh, and here again, we benefit not only from the best molecule derived by Dell, but from the whole suite of interacting molecules of varying potency that can be derived. 
these enable us to discover both a, a, a variety of uh, scaffolds for drug development or for other kinds of inhibitor or activator development, and also uh, to explore the interacting landscape of the target in order to once more combine information from multiple interacting molecules to arrive at a best or most suitable one. Uh, thank you for that. How might, uh, how do you see the uh, DAO's DNA and go to library shaping the future? I mean, there are disciplines, let's say, that could benefit from the DAO platform in biomedical research or other disciplines like to science. Uh, would you have any perspective on that or insights? Yes, so I, I think that uh, Dell, and in particular Dell Open, plays a crucial role in this regard. Uh, I was aware of Dell from the very beginning because of, uh, a, of many discussions with colleagues, such as Richard Lerner, the uh, co-inventor of the idea, with you, Rich. Uh, and I actually went to the president of Stanford University, where I reside, told him that this is going to be revolutionary and you need to make Dell available to everyone on the campus because just about everybody I know when they find out about it and understand it will want to employ it. Well, that didn't actually happen, but Dell Open came to the rescue and Dell Open provided just that kind of access. That in turn will enable the application not only to the areas that I've mentioned, but to others that um, I don't know of, or maybe no one has even thought of. Uh, and that is the importance of broadening access to this important technology. So Dell Opens is really des designed to foster the innovation at this early stage and uh, at this university and institute level. And so what do you say to your colleagues about Dell Open as a platform for seeking that chemical matter, either to support a scientific hypothesis or to seek a you know, chemical matter for, for, a, for a, uh, a, uh, a therapeutic purpose? So I uh, have recommended to everyone I know uh, to exploit this technology because it is applicable to practically every problem under study uh, in academia and of course, every challenge faced in the pharmaceutical industry. And I would emphasize the importance of the application in academia because uh, it is the basic science that is still almost entirely done there uh, that will ultimately advance um, our knowledge and lead to the solutions of seemingly intractable problems. Dell can be a powerful tool in practically every such investigation. Thank you, Roger, for your thoughtful and insightful perspectives on this evolution of the Dell technology the platforms and Dell Open in particular. Uh, thank you, Roger, for, uh, for, for your contributions. My pleasure. Our next speakers will feature uh, case studies on the utility of Dell's and HIC finding. Uh, Professor Matt Disney of the Chemistry Department at Scripps Research. Uh, Florida, and Professor Casey Kruzmark of Medicinal Chemistry and Molecular Pharmacology at Purdue uh, University will examine applications of Dell to their diverse research programs. So I'd like to thank you uh, for joining us today, and thank you, Roger, for your, for, uh, you know, for your time and, uh, and, and your insights. Uh, we really appreciate this very much. With pleasure, Rich. Hello, Enjoy. I'm Dr. Casey Kruzmark from you. Purdue University, and today I'm going to tell you about our experience with the Dell Open Library for the identification of novel substrates to non-receptor tyrosine kinases. But before I do, I want to thank uh, Wuxi and Dell Open for this opportunity, and Wuxi for sponsoring this webinar. So my lab is interested in studying uh, protein tyrosine kinases, which are a family of protein kinases of about 90 members among the larger group of about 520 protein kinases in total in the human uh, genome. Uh, so the importance of these enzymes in cell signaling and in disease hardly needs introduction. And there are, are uh, more than 50 approved kinase inhibitors in the clinic currently. So our goals with the Dell Library uh, were 
twofold. Uh, we were interested in developing novel non-peptidic substrates for tyrosine kinases, one, or, uh, to generate um, starting points for inhibitors that might target the protein binding substrate site rather than the ATP site as a approved, uh, improved approach for selectivity of inhibitors. And the second uh, goal would be to develop improved substrates that could be used as activity probes. So our approach to identification of substrates from the Dell Open Library was a little bit different than the typical affinity selection approach one uses with an immobilized protein to identify ligands. So we took a two-step approach where we first incubated the library with an active tyrosine kinase, an ATP, which would then phosphorylate any phenols in the library that could serve as substrates. And that phenolic phosphate has sufficient affinity that will bind to a nonspecific antiphosphotyrosine antibody, such as the commonly used 4G10, and so we can uh, purify those substrates using an immobilized antibody and elute those with phenylphosphate. We validated that selection approach beforehand using a peptide on DNA. And I should point out, uh, this approach has been used uh, with phage display libraries, as well as uh, Dell's from our own lab. The Dell Open Library kit that they send you contains a sufficient sample for selection under four conditions. We selected three non-receptor tyrosine kinases to generate substrates to, uh, SARC, uh, LIN-A, which are both SARC family tyrosine kinases, and another non-receptor tyrosine kinase, SIC, that's outside of the SARC family. The fourth sample is typically reserved for a no-target control. In our case, we simply selected the library uh, against the 4G10 antibody on beads with no prior treatment with the kinase. So uh, upon DNA sequencing, uh, the Dell Open group will send you Excel files uh, of hits under all of these conditions and separate them, those hits into seven different bins as indicated here with this Venn diagram. So they'll remove all the hits that occur uh, in all four conditions, which hopefully removes the background uh, from uh, bead binding or antibody binding in our case, uh, and then give you uh, separate files for hits that would fit into each of these seven bins. For example, uh, hits that enriched under all three kinases would be in the ABC bin. And our results uh, were particularly rich in hit mo molecules, uh, almost an embarrassment of riches, which made it a li little challenging to decide which molecules to pick. Um, so the largest profile uh, was that ABC group, molecules that enriched by treatment with any of the three kinases with over 25,000 uh, molecules enriching over 100-fold. Uh, the next group was the AB region, which were the two Sark family kinases with nearly 20,000 uh, molecules, and then the last group, um, the sick tyrosine kinase. So I'm going to take you through a little bit of the decision-making process that we went through to pick hits among our hit report. Uh, one of the things that Wushi will send you with your hit report is the generalized structure of the libraries that were, are within the greater pool. We saw a large number of hits in this 08 library of tripeptides, which contained over 100 million members. So to help make our decision, um, we plotted in a 3D plot shown here uh, using the Excel files they sent us and the program MATLAB, all the hits that were enriched under the AB condition for SARC and LIN kinase. And so what we did is plot the building block numbers for the first cycle on the x-axis, second cycle on the y, and the third cycle on the z-axis, and then color code the dots by the enrichment factor, in this case for SARC kinase. And what we saw was uh, a particular plane that occurred uh, with one building block at the first position in particular, uh, 333. Uh, so that, as it happened, turned out to contain uh, tyrosine. So Wushi was kind enough to tell us uh, which hits contained either tyrosine or phenolic moieties uh, to help us identify hits that were likely true hits. And so because we see a plane here, uh, it wasn't too important what building blocks occurred at the second and third position. Uh, we were less interested in these hits because um, you know, tyrosine within a short peptide is not so much news as a substrate. 
We additionally saw a line that occurred at this position where we had two uh, conserved building blocks, uh, 400 and 203, that also contained a phenol. If we looked more closely at those, uh, now pooling all the hits for sarclin and sick in those bins and fixing the third position to contain 203 in that library, we can see that line of, of molecules and a family with 400 at the second position that's particularly highly enriched for lin uh, and not so much for sick. So we selected a molecule uh, in that family, uh, taking to into account both these enrichment factors as well as molecular descriptors that Wuxi sends in that hit report as well, uh, such as molecular weight, C log P, hydrogen bond donors, and acceptors. And so this was the compound that we decided on that was enriched both in SARC and LIN conditions. Additionally, in this 08 library, we saw a particularly enriched family of tripeptides for the sick tyrosine kinase. So in this plot, I plotted all the hits, so summing the four uh, conditions that contained sick kinase, uh, and um, color-coded those dots by the enrichment for sick. And you can see a number of enriched molecules, a number of lines and planes there. Uh, you can still see the 330 plane, if you look closely, that contained tyrosine. Um, but what sticks out enrichment-wise is this particular line here at uh, P2400. Or those are the wrong numbers, actually. That's from the last slide. Um, but we see that line there, and if we looked at that more closely, um, plotting for sarclin and sick uh, individually in 2D, fixing the third building block at 146, we can see a number of lines, um, and in particular, the enrichment again at 57 there stands out for sick. It's present as well in sarc and lin, uh, but the relative uh, enrichments are, are much lower there. So among those, we picked this compound, which, which was missing from Sark and Lin, but similar compounds were enriched, again, based on sick enrichment as well as the molecular descriptors. The last one I'll show you was from a different library of biaryl amides that's perhaps slightly more drug-like, which had about 12 million members. And this showed particular enrichment uh, of molecules under all three kinases. So in the ABC condition. And we plotted those hits. We saw a plane at P1 equals 174, as well as a line uh, at 333 and uh, 14. And the highest enriched was this line at 174.2. And so based on enrichment and molecular descriptors, we picked this trior compound here. So in the end, these are the five molecules that we selected for Wuxi to synthesize and send to us. I didn't show you uh, the plots, but uh, among this 70 library, we selected two formers that had unique phenolic uh, non-amino acid uh, moieties that were likely being phosphorylated that were enriched both for SARC and LIN. I'll point out just a couple other things. Uh, interestingly, one of these tripeptide hits had D stereochemistry for uh, two of the three amino acids. Uh, also in this triural hit, uh, this one contained homotyrosine with an extra methylene there. Um, both the D-stereochemistry and the homotyrosine moiety within peptide substrates uh, results in a dramatic reduction in activity. So once we received these compounds from Wuxi, the first thing we did was to test whether they could be phosphorylated by these kinases, uh, by LCMS. And interestingly, all of them uh, could be uh, substrates uh, for SARC tyrosine kinase. So we plotted the percent phosphorylation by LCMS, and we looked for a correlation of that phosphorylation uh, to the enrichment factor uh, that we saw in the DNA sequencing results. And we didn't see a good correlation there. Um, interestingly, one of the hits, the one in particular that was highly enriched for SIC, that was the only molecule that we could see phosphorylation. We saw phosphorylation for just two of the five compounds for uh, LIN. The next thing we did was look at the kinetics of phosphorylation for uh, the SARC kinase using the ADP glow assay. So we varied the substrate concentrations and looked at uh, created michaelis minton plots to look at these kinetic parameters. And we compared them to the best known peptide substrate for this kinase. Uh, so that, that peptide is this nine peptide we called lintide. 
that was developed by Ben Turk's lab. And that uh, kinase has a pretty low KM of about five micromolar. If we compare the KMs of our hits, some of them uh, compare quite favorably with uh, the lowest being 17 micromolar. But if we look at the KCAT over KMs, uh, by and large, these substrates were about 100-fold worse than lintide was. So as far as substrate capability goes, these are pretty good substrates, and, but not as good as the best one. And most of that came from uh, lower KCATs rather than um, higher KMs. And we have just uh, briefly looked at the potential for these molecules to directly inhibit the activity of SART kinase uh, with some modest success. Um, it's a little challenging to develop assays that can look at inhibition uh, of a kinase using molecules that can also serve as substrates. Uh, but we've seen significant inhibition in some HPLC tests of, of just one of those better substrates, 8-2, with about 20% inhibition at 50 micromolar uh, using a 5 micromolar substrate that we developed in lab. Uh, but this assay wasn't particularly sensitive to inhibition, so we need to uh, work on that a little bit further. We have done just a bit of SAR on some of these hit molecules. And one of the hits we were most interested in was this triarol homotyrosine hit uh, we called 115-1, which had a KM for SARC of about 17 micromolar. Um, because of the sequencing results had a number of uh, building blocks that could occur at the third position, we hypothesized that perhaps the starting material for this last reaction was the true hit. So we synthesized uh, the 115-1A derivative with an aryl bromine there that was the likely starting material for that Suzuki reaction. And that uh, molecule actually showed a significantly higher phosphorylation by LCMS uh, with 75% uh, rather than 61%. Now we also switched out the homotyrosine for the natural tyrosine and found that that made a significant difference. We saw uh, a reduction in phosphorylation to about 9%. And that phosphorylation was dependent on the presence of that bromine as well uh, in 115-1C. Uh, Another compound of interest was uh, this hit 8-8 -8 from the tripeptide library uh, that was the best substrate, the only substrate that was phosphorylated by SIC, and also it was phosphorylated by SARC. This compound had two phenols, so we we're a little uh, unsure which of those might be getting phosphorylated, so we synthesized the two derivatives that lacked either of those uh, phenolic oxygens and tested the phosphorylation by both SARC and SIC. And we saw no phosphorylation in either of those, so both of those are critical for phosphorylation. Uh, so we had to use MSMS um, in order to localize that site of phosphorylation, and it was, in fact, the tyrosine derivative uh, that was phosphorylated. In conclusion, we were quite pleased with these hits that we got. These are uh, really novel chemical substrates for tyrosine kinases. Uh, that there's a lot of new chemical matter to play with here. Um, the hits we got, they're pretty good substrates, uh, considering that they're about a third the size as the best peptide substrates for these tyrosine kinases. Um, that re result may indicate that we're asking uh, a lot of small molecules, and great substrates may need to be uh, higher molecular weight. Uh, also, you know, we received so many hits, um, the selection st stringency might have been a little too weak. If we could go back in time and do this again, we certainly would use less uh, kinase activity. And so we may not have been differentiating great substrates from good substrates in those uh, hit lists. And so uh, additional SAR and activity and inhibition assays are still ongoing, and we're looking towards uh, characterizing these structurally by uh, NMR with collaborators. So I want to um, first, thank the student that performed all this work. It was done by my grad student, John, indicated here in the red circle. And uh, thank Wuxi again. Hi, my name is Matt Disney. I'm a professor in the Department of Chemistry at Scripps Research Institute in Florida. And today I'm going to tell you about some work that me and my group have been doing on using the Dell Open platform to identify uh, and design small molecules that can affect RNA-targeted um, degradation. And so I'll start here by uh, acknowledging the people that did the work in the lab. So uh, Samantha Meyer, this is a collaboration between Samantha Meyer, who's a graduate student in the lab, and Toru Tananaka, uh, that's a visitor from Japan. Um, and so before I get into the talk, I want to sort of thank the people that funded. I also want to thank Wuxi and Dell Open for access to their kit. I want to thank the U.S. taxpayers for enabling us to do the science that we, you know, all dream about. I think uh, 
in this day and age, it's really important uh, to acknowledge um, exactly uh, where we're at in science. We're at a very important time in science where, you know, in the blink of an eye, we have a global pandemic that go uh, across the globe. Uh, it shows how interconnected we are for, you know, which, which, which is always for the better. But in this case, it sort of uh, showed us some of the, the, the liabilities of our interconnectedness. But one of the things that has kept us going through has been science. And so for me personally, I think working with people like Sam and Tora, Toru have really been helpful. Um, our group uh, has worked broadly on degraders, not only this ribonuclease targeting chimera stuff we're going to talk about today, but also direct degraders and exosome-mediated decay mechanisms. Um, and if you're interested, there's a, uh, a video on YouTube that talks more broadly about this work in a general setting. Um, Okay, so the way that Eep and I think about RNA as a druggable entity is we think about it in terms of the folds that it adopts. And so, you know, RNA, as we're all well aware, um, has been, you know, since the very beginning of nucleic acid sequencing, has been known to contribute to being a folded entity to decode messenger RNA sequence into protein sequence. And in fact, it's RNA in concert with that messenger RNA, transfer RNAs, and the large RNA protein complex that is the ribosome that makes, for all intents and purposes, all of the proteins in our bodies. What's, what we've known most recently, and especially after the sequencing of the human genome and, and some earlier work before that that has included the discovery of catalytic RNAs, is that RNA uh, plays broad and intensive roles in human disease biology that goes beyond simply encoding uh, protein. What our lab has done is we tried to figure out ways in which we could target RNA, and oftentimes RNA function is due to its structure, and the way we want to go about targeting RNA is, is targeting those structured regions. Uh, there's two that we think about targeting RNA structure. Uh, the one is what you're most commonly referred to as antisense oligonucleotides, and in ASO approach, you're going to target an RNA sequence that has a low probability of structure. In contrast, there are regions within RNA targets that have a high probability of structure, and it is within those regions uh, that we want to design and deliver small molecules that bind to those structures and affect uh, their function. And we've been able to do this in a pretty broad way by using sequence-based design of ligands that target RNA structure, and a review of that work is uh, in this JAX communication. So we developed uh, computational software over the course of the years that can identify folded regions in an RNA structure, or folded region in an RNA sequence, and we can deduce whether that structure is a, constitutes a druggable pocket. And by being a druggable pocket, it means that we've identified in a database that we've experimentally validated of RNA motif small molecule binding partners, that small molecules will bind to specific structures within this RNA target. That approach is called Inforna, and here's an example of that. If this indeed is a druggable pocket that's highlighted here in green, we have uh, already identified from this database and rational design approach ligands that bind to one site or two sites in this RNA target. Those molecules uh, are predicted to bind to a structure, but that prediction is quite good. We've been able to validate that prediction. Uh, by a variety of mechanisms, including cross-linking small molecules, their RNA targets in cells by using an approach that we call ChemClip or chemical cross-linking and isolation by pull-down, where we can append these small molecules that bind RNA structures with proximity-based cross-linking reagents, and we can purify those cross-links, isolate them, sequence them, and identify not only the RNAs that are bound by a target, but the sites of binding. In many cases, we've been able to show that small molecule RNA targets are not biologically functioning. And in those cases, we've deployed and delivered molecules that can cleave RNA targets with small molecules. Um, in the case here for these ribonuclease targeting chimeras, what we do is we take the small molecule that binds an RNA and we append on it a secondary small molecule. That molecule will bind, recruit, uh, and activate ribonucleases that are present in cells to facilitate the targeted degradation that is both substoichiometric, uh, both catalytic and substoichiometric, to eliminate these affected RNAs from cells. Now, this ribonuclease targeting chimera approach has many flavors uh, because there's many ribonucleases that are expressed in cells. And so what our group uh, want to do 
out initially is identify small molecules that we could uh, append onto uh, RNA binding compounds to recruit and activate uh, ribonucleases to cleave RNA targets. Uh, fortunately, there's a uh, latent ribonuclease, or ribonuclease L, that has been discovered and extensively studied by Rib Robert Silverman. And this is present in all cells as the ribonuclease that's an inactive monomer, and it's activated upon viral infection. And so what's shown to the bottom right here is uh, cells express inactive ribonuclease, and then uh, upon a viral infection, this 2 prime, 5 prime linked oligoadenylate, or these unnaturally linked adenylates, will bind to, dimerize, and activate monomeric RNase L, and that will facilitate viral messenger RNA cleavage, which will produce interferon, and this can recycle. And so um, the question that we had in the lab, could we develop an approach, and here's three such approaches that we've uh, focused on to cleave RNA targets, where we could take a small molecule that binds to an RNA, secondary to that molecule that binds an RNA, we'll append on it a molecule that can recruit and activate ribonuclease L to unnaturally interface an RNA target by nature of the RNA binding preferences that that small molecule has with uh, RNA quality control machinery. Fortunately for us, there were two previously published ligands that bind to and activate ribonuclease. One is this 2 prime 5 prime oligoadenylate that we've used to recruit RNA cell in cells. And the second is this heterocycle that's been published by the Silverman Group in this PNAS paper and that we've done some medicinal chemistry on it. Um, and so one of the things that we've shown with this RNA cell approach is that the advantage is that it's substoichiometric, that it has great potential for optimization. But one of the issues is it's not necessarily rule of five-like. These things target cytoplasmic RNAs, and the first-generation molecules degrade about 40 to 70% of the target. And so we wanted to invest broadly on uh, studying uh, the nature of molecular recognition of molecules that bind to this ribonuclease, um, because at the end of the day, what we'd really to do is develop medicinal approaches to shrink the size of these compounds such that we could have ribotax perhaps and perhaps in the future be delivered as a oral approach that could have a similar to antisense-like mechanism to affect RNA targeting. Um, we have shown that ribonuclease L recruiters can bind to and affect RNA targets in this PNAS paper. I'm not going to go into a lot of this, but suffice it to say we can stitch these molecules together in a rational approach. Uh, the green compound and the green bars are the molecules that affect targeted degradation uh, of this oncogenic uh, microRNA21 in this paper that was published in 2020. These molecules uh, can not only work in cells, but also reduce lung metastasis by mechanistically defined way to uh, cleave these oncogenic RNA targets in cells to animals. And in this case here is they'll diminish the presence of lung metastases or nodules that are observed in mice uh, that are fed with these um, ribotac nuclease recruiting molecules. And so we're very happy. Uh, we have obviously a long relationship with Richard Lerner, who's the former president of Scripps Research, uh, great friend, colleague, mentor. And Richard uh, is one of the pioneers in DNA encoded chemistry. And, and uh, we were fortunate enough to be able to talk to, to Richard Soule, where the question we had is, could we take a Dell Open Kit and identify molecules that could bind to a monomeric RNA cell? So we're doing a screen for compounds that bind to monomeric RNA cell. And so the Dell Open Kit had 2.8 million compounds. We did an affinity enrichment. We found 127 pits with greater than 100 uh, enrichment scores, and we were given the top four hits uh, to test them. With those top four hits, it's not clear that these molecules would be able to affect targeted degradation because we did a screen with the monomer. Uh, nevertheless, 50% of those molecules that uh, we tested were able to affect targeted degradation. And so this is uh, an assay where we took those four compounds at different concentrations. And if the signal goes up, that means that they're able to cleave uh, reporter RNA target that is a very sensitive substrate for ribonuclease L degradation. What we next did is then see the ability of these compounds to facilitate 
uh, the molecules, not just for cleaving RNA cell, but by nature of the fact that they're cleaving this target, they have to dimerize, but to simply serve as molecular glues. And what we can see here in this panel to the far right in the Western blot is that these molecules not only are able to facilitate targeted degradation, but even though they were selected to bind to a monomer, uh, those monomeric selected binding compounds are able to facilitate dimerization of RNA cell and serve as a molecular glue. Um, so we were really satisfied by this, and it, it, I think it points to uh, something really important about um, sites within monomeric RNA cell that one could bind. In fact, evolutionarily, that protein could have evolved, uh, you know, sites within that target that bind naturally two prime, five prime oligoadenylates, but also could be very druggable pockets um, for some of these ligands that the Dell Open kits are binding. And so we were very gratified by this because it wasn't anticipated that we would be able to screen and identify ligands that bind to monomeric RNA cell that would not only bind to it, but facilitate it being converted into a dimer. And then that dimer would not be inhibited with the compound, but facilitate uh, degradation of an RNA target. And so, so here are the conclusions. So we've been able to take uh, the Dell Open DNA encoded libraries and have been able to identify compounds that bind to ribonucleases. In this iteration, we've been able to screen compounds that bind to monomeric inactive form of ribonucleases, and half of those compounds that bind, in fact, were able to stimulate the formation of catalytically competent dimeric molecules uh, that activated the ribonuclease, uh, therefore serving as a molecular glue. Um, more studies are ongoing with the system, and we're going to be reporting that in due course. I think one of, uh, from my perspectives, major advantages of the Dell Open is the crowdsourcing that uh, this allows. Uh, because there's a wide variety of screens that have been done on a wide variety of different targets, there's a tremendous data set that's being leveraged to identify which compounds are bona fide uh, binding molecules uh, versus ones that might be frequent hitters or not as robustly bound. And because this enabled in a DNA encoded format, one can quickly and informatically identify these molecules. Um, so thanks for taking the time. I want to um, also thank Sam and Toru, who did the work, uh, Richard Soul, um, who, and the Dell Open team who gave us access to their infrastructure, and Richard Lerner for making a connection. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Jason Dung, Dr. Matt Disney, and Dr. Casey Kuzmark for this excellent presentation today. Before we get to our Q&A session, I just want to remind the audience that this webinar will be archived at CNN online after the, the live webcast. And now we'll open up to questions. Uh, this one is for Casey. Are the majority of amino acids single enantiomer only? Um, good question. Uh, so we don't, as users, don't exactly know what's in the library. Um, you know, the peptidic portion of the library is just a, a one of the several libraries uh, that are in that collection. And we focused on that largely because we knew that kinase accepted peptidic substrates. Um, but it does look like they're using stereospecific. Based on the hits we selected, you know, stereochemistry was indicated in those. So um, those are encoded separately rather than encoded as a mixture. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I have another one for you. Uh, do you have examples where differences in R and S isomers show big difference in binding, hence give evidence of highly selective binding? Um, for those two hits, we haven't done that yet, but that's, that's in the queue of things to do. Uh, we've been focusing maybe uh, more so on that uh, isoxazole hit with the homotyrosine, which is a little bit more drug-like than the peptide ones. But that is, of course, on our list of things to do uh, with that's a proper SAR experiment that we should make the uh, RNS isomers to show that those are uh, more specific interactions. Okay, uh, this one is for Jason. Since the barcode is a DNA fragment, do you see problems in running DNA binding proteins? And there's a second part to that question, but I'll let you answer this part first. Okay, so thanks. Uh, it's generally perceived that uh, the DNA tags might cause uh, non-specific background binding from the, the tags, DNA tags. 
Um, and it's, it is well acknowledged when we are developing the Dell platform and the Wuxi app tag. So we apply uh, two, uh, lab, uh, two sort of approaches to uh, mitigate this issue. One is uh, wildlife-based that we uh, add scrambled DNA fragments to uh, block the, uh, the potential non-specific binding during the selections. And if the, the target has a known uh, DNA binding sequence, we can also use that to specifically block the binding. And also use uh, some computational method to analyze the, uh, the potential motif uh, that arise from the DNA binding, uh, the DNA uh, output. And then uh, we can use that to identify uh, if, if the binding is dependent on the, either on the uh, DNA tag or on the uh, the small molecules. Okay. And the second part to this question, I'm not quite sure if you already answered it. What are yeah. the approaches to distinguish between molecules that binds the protein or DNA that binds it? Right. Yes, I think, as yeah, I mentioned, we, we applied basically uh, both the wild lab and the computational approach to, uh, to help uh, distinguish those differences. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, this you. question is for Matt. Um, I am wondering if it's possible to use DEL to identify small molecule inhibitors directly targeting RNA, and is the negative charge on RNA an issue to perform DEL on RNA? Yeah, so we, you know, we don't have any experience in doing that uh, directly within the system. Um, I think the bigger issue is the stoichiometric amount of DNA tag in this DEL setup could interfere, could, could interfere with RNA binding and cause a bunch of issues. There has been um, one report that I'm aware of of using the DEL format to bind compounds that, uh, to, to identify compounds that bind, I think, DNA G quadruplexes. Uh, the reference is escaping me, but so there is, a, is, is one example of uh, using DEL to bind nucleic acids, but I am not aware of one using it to bind RNA. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I think this one is back to Jason for an additional question. What is the current strategy of HIT validation after DEL selections? Okay, so uh, conventionally, we uh, um, sort of um, select the top uh, structures from the DEL selections and uh, we synthesize the, the compound of DNA tags and uh, validate the compounds in either uh, in the biophysics or biochemical uh, cell-based assays. More recently, uh, there has been a development of uh, on-DNA-based uh, validation methods, mainly utilizing the, uh, the finished selection uh, mass spectrometry. Uh, for the platform that we are developing in Wuxi, we, uh, we actually um, uh, we are able to resynthesize the, uh, the compounds with the DNA tags using the same chemistry libraries. And then we uh, run through the, uh, this this synthesized structure through uh, affinity-based selections against the targets uh, in individual fashion, individual uh, compound per well fashion. Then we can decode the actual binding uh, species uh, in these uh, in these wells. So it's that way to first confirm the overall binding to our target, and also can help us decide whether it is the, uh, the full design product or the byproduct of the reaction that actually mediates the binding. Okay, thank you. Also, uh, there's an additional one also for you, Jason. Um, would Dell be able to evolve into activity phonetic screening? Okay, uh, so as uh, Dr. Kornberg mentioned earlier about the uh, microfluidics method, I think that's a very powerful platform that it can be coupled with the Dell technology to uh, provide droplet-based or cell, single-cell-based uh, assay uh, capabilities. So uh, I would say when, you know, that, that would help, actually help us to uh, further develop this into a, uh, either an enzyme activity-based screening or a um, sort of cell-based phenotypic uh, screening. Okay, thank you very much. And I believe we have time for just one more additional question. Uh, this one is also for Jason. Any example on data sharing? How does it provide value to the community? 
So, so this one actually we do have uh, a, a number of cases that where we have uh, uh, have the uh, data exchange between uh, Wuxi as a Dell provider and the, the users. So I think one one case is that we uh, recently had this uh, exchange with uh, Dr. Casey Kuzmark where uh, we, we sort of exchange the uh, the data and the data will be the selection data will be uh, available on the Dell Open platform that is. Uh, uh, can be can be accessed by the, the open community. So the idea is that we can use this platform to facilitate uh, the, the data sharing uh, with the spirit that you know, the users come in with the willingness to uh, to sort of exchange the, uh, the to sort of share the the uh, target and the selection information and uh, also. Take the benefit that uh, the, the developer can also, in return, provide the uh, this, this compound structures back to the user, so that they can uh, own the uh, they actually own the IP of those compounds, and they can uh, take the take this compound for the for the development in the uh, drug discovery program. Um, and I believe. An additional question has just come in that I think we can squeak in, um, and this is also for Jason. Is there any correlations between the enrichment value and the real binding affinity data? Um, I guess uh, it, it's uh, it's uh, right now based on our observations, it is uh, some uh, somewhat uh, correlation uh, for certain, uh, I would say, uh, uh, chemo types. So first of all, there are definitely some false positives from the Dell uh, selections. Once we, you know, but for the ones that we confirm the chemotypes, there's some uh, level of uh, uh, binding affinity. Uh, the correlation between binding affinity and the enrichment in that cluster of uh, chemotypes. But also, in sort of evaluating these uh, using uh, sort of DNA ASMS method, another validation method to collecting the data. But there's, uh, I would say, with, with the active compound that can confirm, there are definitely some, some uh, correlations observed. Thank you very much, Jason. Uh, this is our final question that we're able to, to get in today. And I'm not quite sure who this one is for, uh, so if somebody would like to take the lead, that would be great. Do you have high false positive or false negative rates as artifacts of sequencing? How much redundancy do you incorporate into the DNA barcode sequences? Uh, I can give a try on this one. Um, it's for the for the artifact rate from the sequencing itself, uh, there's two concerns. One is the uh, the basically the mutation that arises during the PCR amplification, um, and also there may be some other sort of DNA damage related issues du during the, the step of the library synthesis. Um, for for us to cope that we. Uh, applied some uh, sort of correlation co correction method that uh, helped to uh, correct the, the mutated sequence back to original uh, tags. Uh, and in general, we actually apply in uh, about three to five times uh, sequencing depth when we, uh, um, when, we uh, when we sequence the samples. So I would say the redundancy is between three to five in our, in our case. Okay. Uh, that's about all the time that we have today. Uh, I want to give a great thank you to Dr. Jason Dung, Dr. Roger Kornberg, Dr. Richard Soule, Dr. Casey Kuzmark, and Dr. Matthew Disney for this enlightening presentation today. And thank you to our audience for being uh, a wonderful participant. Be sure to check CNEN or CNEN online for information on the next edition of CNEN webinars. Thank you also to On24 for technology and production services, and a special thank you to Wuxi App Tech for their sponsorship that made this interactive webcast possible. For more information about Dell Open, go to dellopen.org or contact a Wuxi App Tech representative in your region. For CNEN webinars, I'm Melissa Romero. Goodbye. <laughs>